Men Haoran, overnight at Master Jay's mountain lodge, waiting in vain for my old friend Ding. The sun begins to sink below the western peaks. Valleys, one by one, are steeped in shadow. The moon rises through the pines. The night grows chill. Breezes coax clear music from the spring. Woodsmen make ready to return home. In light mist, birds begin to find a resting place. You promised you'd be here with me today. I'm waiting with my lute along the, this fine draped path. So this is the third and the last of the pentasyllabic gushi of Meng Haoran that are included in the 300 Tang poems. Uh, like the previous two, this is also a poem about, this is a poem sent to a friend or um, in trying to communicate with a friend, in this, guy, in this case a person called Ding. It's also set in a natural landscape, in a mountain lodge, um, where the poetic persona and probably the physical person of Meng Haoran spent a night waiting uh, for his friend to arrive after probably having made an arrangement for that meeting to happen there. Now this is a poem therefore uh, we can see from the title that it's going to be a nature poem, landscape nature poem, which is going to probably present us some of the views or sights or experiences that can be had in a mountain and in a mountain lodge. It's also a poem about friendship, uh, frustrated friendship in that the poetic persona does not meet with his friend. We know many Chinese poems are sent to friends, are shared with friends, and uh, in a lot of Chinese poems, this is almost a subgenre. We have a person visiting, the poet is visiting a friend or a hermit and does not find him at home. So he, I imagine he leaves the poem as a, a calling card, as, uh, as a memento of his presence there and of his frustrated attempt at visiting the friend, the sage. A little paraphrase of this poem. This poem is divided into two stanzas. Now, the first one introduces us to the scenery at the mountain. When the poem starts, we're already in the mountain and we're looking at nature in a very cinematic way because the different images that we see uh, are, have, all, have a, a way of chronologically ordering the sights and, and showing us that it, night is falling and that it's becoming dark. So the sun begins to sink below the western peaks, so it's sunset. Valleys one by one are steeped in shadow. And I like this image very much. As the sun is setting, Darkness starts to crawl in all those valleys below that can be seen from the mountain lodge. Each of them disappears, is obliterated by shadow, one by one, the further they are from the west. The moon rises through the pines, the night grows chill, so time keeps passing. After the sun has set, now the moon has risen, it's visible through the pines. The moon in the pines is a staple fair, a staple image of beauty in Chinese and Japanese poetry, and it gets colder, of course. And finally, breezes coax clear music from the spring. So instead of the visual, here we have an oral image yeah, of sound. You could argue that the night grown chill in the previous line is also a, 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 an appeal to another sense, to the sense of touch, to the sense of coldness. So this last image brings us a musical sound, which is coming because the breeze is blowing over a spring of running water, creating a nice, a nice melodic sound. Now the second stanza, uh, we continue in the mountain, but the second stanza moves us firmly into the, the human realm, and it includes different images of humans and animals retiring for the night. So it's late at night, and what most creatures do at night is go to sleep. Woodsmen make ready to return home. So the, the workers, the simple men who work in the woods cutting wood, go to, go to sleep. In light mist, birds begin to find a resting place. So the birds also are looking for their nests. And finally, the last couplet is the one that directly sends a message to that old friend Ding 
who has not arrived. You promised you'd be here with me today. I'm waiting with my lute along this fine draped path. Now this poem is built on a series of images, but I'd say the most effective, the one that really summarizes the poem for me is the last one. And I can clearly visualize Menhauran, a scholar at night in a forested environment with a little hat to his right, strumming on the lute in a vine draped path that's to the left of him looking with longing to see if his friend finally arrives. Now this image also connects with another subgenre of Chinese poetry which I'll call uh, wakefulness at night. In those, I think we've talked about this subgenre in one of the previous poems. In this genre you have a poetic persona which might be a man or a woman who is unable, who is incapable of sleeping. And he or she is unable to sleep because he is missing another person. And uh, the lover or the friend. And uh, we get descriptions of things that the poetic persona does at night. Well, sometimes it's not the poetic persona some, because it's not the speaker of the poem who is without sleep. Sometimes it's a woman who is being seen through the eyes of, of, of the poetic persona, of the poet. But in any case, we get different views of, uh, of a person doing things at night, staring in the bed, going out and looking at the moonlight in the garden, trying to fiddle or play with a lute. And we get this here. Uh, Meng Haoran does not want to sleep. He is so keen to enjoy the company of his old friend Ding that he wastes the night probably um, awake, strumming on his lute feeling sad and melancholy at his friend not coming. So, interesting poem. I like the, the contrast between those natural images and those images of, of rest and retirement in the last stanza that are thwarted by the ending, where the poet himself is not able to rest or return home, but keeps awake playing his lute. Quite a nice poem. Next day we will move on to some other poets that are not as famous as the ones we've been talking about now. So see you tomorrow.